Hello there. So, you play guitar. And now you want to get into that world of recording or using amp sims and, you know, whatever other people are actually doing when they magically plug their guitars into their computers. Then you might make that mistake of asking for help and you end up having people fighting over some details that many of which might or might not be true. In my opinion, it's better to understand what you actually need rather than blindly trusting the loudest person in the room. Let's start with a practical example that should be somewhat easy to understand. This young handsome man here is me some eons ago. My solos are lightning fast, but the speed of sound is just what it says up here. My amplifier is about 5 meters or 70 feet away from me, and using the speed of sound we can calculate that there's a delay of about 15 milliseconds for me to hear my amazing licks. But if you've done gigs like this, you know that you usually don't have your amp this far away, but you actually have front monitors or earbuds. Main reason is obviously that you have a mixing engineer who wants to do their job, but also because that 15 millisecond delay might actually be noticeable for you. Now, if you have the front monitors and they are about 2 meters or 7 feet away from you, and that still results in 6 millisecond delay, which you already know is completely undetectable. If someone else says otherwise, they are either lying or they have some other gear in the signal chain that causes some additional delay. But that 6 millisecond delay, also known as latency, you cannot hear. To extend that a bit, think about playing midway there, 3.5 meters or 11 feet away from the amp, that's 10 millisecond delay. I believe there could be people, especially drummers, who could notice that, but I don't think they would really be bothered by that. Still, you wouldn't even know this, and that's what matters. So these here are very good reference values for what you really need from your digital audio gear to have a good experience. That a delay when your guitar single gets processed by your computer and comes back to your ears, that is called round-trip latency. Be aware that many people might give you false values of their gear because their door or driver might give them some specific latency values. But those values could be input latency, output latency, door latency, DSP latency, driver latency, but the only latency that actually matters is the round-trip latency. So don't just blindly trust what people say, or even if they show you some latency-related screenshots. Zero latency doesn't exist. That's just physically impossible, especially in digital world. But there are still setups that we can call zero latency, because it's not processed by the computer at all. Let me show a few examples. In this setup, you hear what you play from your amp, and you play along with some backing track. That's playing in your computer and coming out of your monitors. Your experience is zero latency, completely regardless of the audio gear you use. But this is also likely not why you are interested in getting an audio interface. You can't even record like this. To do that, you could mic your amp. For instance, get an SM57. This is still zero latency setup for you, but now you can kind of record and even stream your jam. But if you are recording, you probably have a click track or other tracks you play along with, and now your amp microphone might be capturing feedback from those monitors. So obviously, you add headphones. But especially with closed back headphones or earbuds, you can't hear your amp that good anymore unless you are running your signal through the computer which is a case we will go through later. The zero latency option is to get an audio interface that has something called direct monitoring or direct out. Many even the cheapest ones have this. So when the option is on, the interface passes your input signal directly to the headphones while you also hear what the computer outputs. This setup is completely valid, zero latency, and requires no special audio processing related power from your computer or the interface. Now, of course, if you have a multi-track session playing back from that computer, then it needs to be capable enough to play that back for you. And the more you add tracks and plugins to the mix, the more hardware intensive it becomes for your computer. But your audio interface can be whatever piece of shit, and it will still be a good experience performance-wise. 
audio quality wise, it might be a different story. So, with this setup, you can't really use amp sims because you are already recording signal from your amplifier. If you want to play with those, one option is to get a DI box and an audio interface that has two inputs. The DI box splits your guitar signal so that you can feed it to your amp and also to the audio interface as a dry signal. So in your computer, you can now choose to record the dry signal and then apply amp sim to that single later. You don't hear the amp sim when you are playing, but you will hear it when you play along with, with the tracks. In fact, in this setup, you might be hearing both the amplified reference signal and also the dry signal, unless your audio interface has channel-specific direct monitoring, so that you'd only hear the physical amp signal in your ears. So now your shopping cart has an audio interface, a microphone and a DI box. I bet this begins to look like an expensive hobby. This setup I'm showing basically because I know some of you are thinking about it. So let's break it down. Well, first of all, you put your guitar into the instrument or high Z or high impedance channel. There might be a switch or a button for that, but or, or a picture of a guitar. And this is because your guitar signal is an instrument level signal. There is also microphone level, but that is detected by the interface because of the XLR connector. But an instrument and line level are the same type of connector, so you must define which one you are actually plugging in. Anyway, this setup kind of allows you to record dry signal while hearing yourself through the amp. But first of all, the direct monitoring is line level and your amp expects instrument level. It can take it and it doesn't break, but it's just not, not meant for it. Bigger problem is that you would also be playing back all the reference tracks to your amp, which is obviously far from ideal. Now you could get an audio interface that has multiple output channels, but then it also needs to be a device that has pretty high configurability. The last zero latency case is probably also the most expensive one a DSP capable audio interface. These type of interfaces can load a plugin like an amp sim within the interface itself. But be aware that this is not a generic solution. Third party plugins are not supported, only proprietary ones. So if you want to run neural DSP amp sims like this, then you actually need to get their quad cortex. That is actually a stone box that can be used as an audio interface. But then you are limited to those only. Realistically, better option is to run that amp sim in your computer, especially if you want to try many different things. But then you need to worry about the round trip latency. And here is how that works. Your guitar outputs analog signal, and that signal gets sampled by the analog to digital converter within the audio interface. If you take 12 samples from one second of sound, your sample rate is 12. So now you know what the sample rate is. It's just how many of these discrete digital values are sampled from one second of audio signal. 12 is obviously not a usable sample rate, but rather the minimum amount of samples you need to get from each second is 44,000 to have a good digital representation of the original analog signal. 44.1 and 48 kilohertz are the ones you should use. You might have heard of 88 or 96 or even 192 sampling rates, but going over 48 has zero benefits for you at home. So now there are tens of thousands of samples in the USB bus every second. What does your computer do? It takes some small number of them. Then it processes those by giving them to your DAW or standalone amp sim or plugins or whatnot. And when they have done their job, it puts those samples to the output buffer. That N there is the buffer size. Regardless of what devices or DAWs or systems you are running, you should always be able to configure these two numbers, sample rate and buffer size. They are very important. If you have sample rate of 44.1 kHz and a buffer size of 256, which are very common values, it means that from that one second that is digitized into 44,100 samples, 256 are taken to be processed by everything that's running on that computer. And that means that there's always at least that 5.8 millisecond delay using these particular values. 
But in round trip, there is both input and output buffer. So having these particular values, you actually never can have below 11.6 millisecond latency. Yes, yes, DSP capable audio interfaces can, but as said, they are very limited for home guitarists and you'd end up running some amp sims on the computer anyway. This is also quite universal. Core audio in Mac, ASIO in Windows and Pipewire in Linux. Unfortunately, this is not the whole story though. Uh, there is always a little bit of device latency, but basically anything you can buy even used shouldn't have much more than a millisecond. Driver latency, especially in Windows, can be a bit nasty, but assuming you have everything correctly set, it should be around one millisecond. But again, round trip, in and out, so it's double. Lightning is slightly faster than USB. But as you can see, in these equations, it's actually not that meaningful. Instead, it's reported to be slightly less reliable than USB, which is somewhat expected for something that is newer and not as established. When it comes to USB 2 versus USB 3, there is zero difference in latency. Bandwidth of USB 2 is perfectly capable until you start to record dozens of channels at the same time. So let's just say that 4 milliseconds is what you will get with some OK device you buy today, new or used. Even the worst of the worst wouldn't double that if it's still a USB 2 device. On the other hand, even the best of the best PCI Express device could give you zero device and driver latency. It's still almost irrelevant if you have bad settings for the buffer size and sampling rate. So this is what you must understand first. Lowering the buffer size setting will have the biggest positive effect in latency. But the smaller the buffer or higher the sample rate, the more work your CPU must do to get all those digitized samples processed. When it's not up for the task anymore, you will start to hear cracks and pops. That is the sound of samples that your CPU didn't have time to process. And this is also directly dependent on how many plugins it has to process. So what is the correct setting? Well, there is not one correct setting. When you are recording, latency can be an issue, so go as small buffer size as possible. But when you are mixing, the latency doesn't matter. You can add even 10 times more plugins to your session if you just set up the buffer very high, up to 1000, even 4000. But what is a small enough buffer for recording? Let's aim for that 10 millisecond that you didn't notice. As we went through already, you can expect the device and driver latency to cause some of the latency. And these values I found from different sources and they might not be accurate, but it's obvious more expensive ones tend to be faster and cheaper ones slightly slower. 4 milliseconds is still a reasonable expectation. So if you use 44.1 kHz sampling rate, buffer sizes 512 and above are a no-go zone. 256 is on the area that you might feel, but you also might not be bothered about that. 128 falls below 10 milliseconds, so I would recommend that. 64 is showing off if you have a modern computer that can pull that off, but 32 is just stupid and probably very unstable even with high-end CPU. Next we have the 48 kHz table, and that is basically the same as the sample rate is not that much different. 96 kHz is usually not used at home, but I'm just showing it in case your computer struggles with 256 and lower buffer sizes, because in 96 kHz you can still get reasonable round trip latency with buffer size 512, and in some cases this might actually be easier on your CPU. Pulling it all together, these are my recommendations. Regardless of the audio interface you get, buffer size 128 should be good experience. But it is completely dependent on your computer's CPU, can it process an amp sim like Neural DSP, Tonex, Helix, NAM, Kitaric with these settings. If you get a thousand euro or thousand dollar audio interface in hopes of shaking that 4 millisecond device and driver latency completely off, you are still going to be very fast back in the situation that your CPU is going to be the bottleneck of your system. And one last advice. Using these settings here, if you still experience noticeable latency, 
For the love of God, do not use anything wireless, especially headphones. Technical specifications of the latest and greatest Bluetooth APTX low latency encoder state that approximately 40 millisecond latency can be achieved. So even the latest and greatest Bluetooth is unusable at best. Thank you for staying this very long rumble. This is a subject that many people might have very strong opinions on. And this is just how much I believe I know about the subject. If I got some facts incorrect, which definitely can happen, then please, please, please leave an angry comment and I will pin that up after checking the facts. Thank you for joining and have a nice new year 2025.